if you had at your command all the resources of the Congress to investigate the Chinese Communist Party, what would you learn? We're about to find out. Congressman Michael Gallagher of Wisconsin on Uncommon Knowledge Now. Not yet 40, Republican Congressman Mike Gallagher has earned an undergraduate degree from Princeton, a master's degree from the National Intelligence University, two master's degrees from Georgetown. Is that right? You hold three master's? Yeah, one doesn't count. One you sort of get en route to a PhD, so it's sort of fake, but All technically, right. yeah. All right. But you did, and a doctorate from Georgetown, served seven years in, in the United States Marine Corps, and has been elected four times to the House of Representatives from Wisconsin's 8th District, which includes Appleton and Green Bay. I should note that the last time he ran for re-election, the Democrats did not even put up an opponent. I should also note that Congressman Gallagher does pretty well on his feet. Uh, for the last six years, he has competed in the Three Mile Capital Challenge and won fastest House rep all six times. In this, his fourth term in Congress, Congressman Gallagher is chairing the House Committee on the Chinese Communist Party. Mike Gallagher, welcome. It is an honor to be here. All right, just save that. Well, you covered for Tom Cotton by qualifying it as fastest House rep, House but rep. I beat him, so it's just fastest member of Congress. It's fine. All right. All right. He's very sensitive about this. We'll, 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 we'll give him an opportunity to respond at the end of the show. This is you writing in the Wall Street Journal, quote, America's greatest threat is the Chinese Communist Party, close quote. Could I ask a question to try to establish what's at stake? If the Chinese Communist Party gets everything it wants, mm -hmm. if President Xi Jinping attains every last one of his goals, how does life change in Green Bay or Appleton? <laughs> what difference does it make to us? Well, first of all, I think any honest assessment of Xi Jinping's goals has to conclude, and even members of the Biden administration, like Rush Doshi, who's the lead on the National Security Council for China in his book, The Long Game, basically gets to this point that their goal is to, he would say, displace America from its position of primacy in the world. I would say a bit more pro provocatively to destroy American global leadership. So how does this affect someone who lives in Green Bay? Well, in at least two ways. Two ways I think this competition is existential. When I use that term, I get a lot of blowback and people claim I'm hyping the threat. One is that if we come to blows with China over Taiwan, if they try to take Taiwan by force, and I think the odds of that are increasing, this could quickly spiral into a conflict that's so severe. It has the potential to make the current wars in Ukraine and in the Middle East and even previous world wars look tame in comparison. It could even escalate to the level of a nuclear exchange, which would be devastating. But the second and more insidious threat posed by the CCP is, how do I describe this? Take every instance of a major American company or corporation, like Disney or the NBA, silencing or self-censoring for fear of angering Chinese Communist Party officials, for fear of losing market access. If China were to attain its goal of displacing us from the region and ultimately becoming the dominant global power, you can multiply that by 20 in terms of the economic coercion that they would wield. And it would amount to a fundamental loss of what it means to be not only American, but a member of the free world. Gone would be concepts like free expression, freedom of religion. Uh, maybe I guess I'll add a third, which is that particularly in the industrial Midwest over the last two decades, a lot of people have lost their jobs. Entire industries have been destroyed because of the Chinese Communist Party's predatory economic practices, its failure to abide by the promises it made when it acceded to the WTO. So for a military reason, for an economic reason, and for what I would call an ideological reason, the CCP is our greatest threat. All right. Can I, so you're chairing the, what is the full title? House Committee on the Chinese <laughs> Communist Party. Can you give me a sentence? What is the main takeaway? What have you learned? They're worse than you thought? <laughs> what have you learned? Uh, well, that it is uh, related to your previous question. It's not a distant <clears throat> over there problem, right? It's not something that solely concerns the Taiwanese or the Japanese or Asian countries. It is a right here at home problem. And as someone who entered this conversation primarily from the perspective of a former military officer who worked 
on the House Armed Services Committee and spent a lot of time thinking about the future of the Navy and the Marine Corps and how do we deter a PLA invasion of Taiwan. I've learned so much about what they're doing here domestically in order to undermine American sovereignty and really to put a pit Americans against Americans. That's sort of the title of a book by Wang Huning, who's one of the most powerful members of the Politburo, and I think accurately describes the CCP strategy. For example, the first event we did uh, on the committee, and it was myself and a Democratic member of the committee, Richie Torres, was- You worked very hard to make this committee bipartisan. To the best, and that, and that really was the vision that former Speaker McCarthy and Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries had for, for the committee. It's, we're not gonna grant everything, but to the extent possible, if Congress can speak with one voice when it comes to how we successfully compete with our greatest national security threat, that is a good thing. But we did a rally with a bunch of human rights activists in front of an illegal Chinese Communist Party police station in the heart of Manhattan. And three years ago, I was completely unaware of that phenomenon. We've had, I'd now learned- Wait, was, What was in Manhattan? A, an illegal CCP police station uh, registered to an innocuous sounding nonprofit group. But they was, had their police in Manhattan? It was being used to surveil, harass, and in some cases physically assault people on American soil, Chinese Americans, members of the Chinese diaspora, et cetera. The FBI has since made a series of arrests uh, in connection with this case. Uh, we've learned about uh, similar things happening on American campuses where you know Chinese student groups linked to the Chinese Student Scholars Association are being used to intimidate uh, uh, Chinese students who are criticizing the regime, Taiwanese students. So this extent of what's called united front work, which is what she refers to as a magic weapon of influence and coercion, was something that I didn't fully appreciate until I took on this job. And I continue to believe there's more we need to do to shine a light on it. Um, okay, military stuff. Mike Gallagher in the Wall Street Journal, this is a, an interview you gave about a year ago. The United States is facing, quote, a window of maximum danger. Explain that. Well, uh, there are various people, most famously probably former Indo-PACOM commander Admiral Davidson, who said, uh, he, he said uh, that Xi Jinping may make a move on Taiwan within the next five years. This then became known as the Davidson window uh, after a hearing we held with him in the Armed Services Committee. There's other analysts at the Naval War College like Andrew Erickson who have pointed out in light of Xi Jinping's massive demographic and economic challenges, which become most acute in the 2030s, it's increasingly likely that he will try to achieve his lifelong ambition, which is to take Taiwan by force if necessary, to use Xi's phrase, in this decade. I think the window becomes most acute, starting with the election in Taiwan that's gonna happen in January of 2024, particularly if the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party wins, as seems likely, she will conclude that he cannot achieve this ambition via political warfare, so he will resort to actual kinetic warfare in order to absorb Taiwan. Okay, hold on, you're saying things that are, I thought I was prepared for this, but you're saying things that are shocking me. First of all, Chinese police in Manhattan. Now you're saying that the window could open in January, not years from now, not months from now. As you and I sit here, that's weeks from now yeah. that the Taiwanese election will take place. All right. Can you take me through, the, because this gets, this gets a little bit, it's not that confusing, but it gets confusing. South China Sea, what have they already done there? And then, because Americans are going to be hearing more and more and more about this, there's a thing called the first island chain, and then there's a thing called the second island chain. And to follow the military situation in the Pacific, you actually have to know what they are, correct? Yes. Okay, so give yeah. me the South China Sea. <laughs> well, it's actually very interesting. I think when, you know- You have all these, de all these degrees, teach me. Teach well, me. I, I know, yeah, it's, uh, uh, as Eisenhower said of academics, they're men who take more words than necessary to tell you more than they know. Um, and I'm about to prove that case. Uh, uh, historians continue to debate, debate like when the first Cold War began, right? Was it when Orwell first used the phrase? Was it uh, Soviets detonating a nuclear weapon in 1949? Was it the invasion of Korea in 1950? They will, they will also debate for decades to come when this new Cold War with communist China began. But I think you at least have to date it prior to Xi Jinping when China started to make all these claims for territory in the South China Sea. They unsuccessfully petitioned for recognition of various expansive claims in multilateral fora. And when that failed, uh, they just started building islands. They just started literally- and why? Why did they want them? Uh, it, because, well, they A, historically believed that they belonged to China, and B, in order to project power throughout the rest uh, of the region. Right now, we're seeing um, Chinese um, uh, maritime militia and Navy vessels harass uh, Philippine 
um, ships in so the second time of shoal. If you have, in effect, permit uh, in place aircraft carriers, which is what these little islands yeah. amount to, isn't it? I guess you can land planes on them, then you're putting pressure on Vietnam, the Philippines. Yeah, and I think, it, it, again, even like center left analysts would say their interim goal is to push the U.S. Navy out of the Indo Pacific. And so these claims and the island building campaign and the really unprecedented <laughs> militarization of the South China Sea is all in pursuit uh, of that goal. And they've sort of shoving us out. Yeah, and they've tailor built a military designed to shove us out over the last 20 years. So we can say our military is more capable overall, but they're fighting a home game and they've gone to school on how they can best frustrate our goals in the Pacific. For example, it, it, in some ways even more important than the fact that they've built the world's largest navy. And they have, right? They have more ships than us. Our ships on balance are on average are more capable, but quantity has a quality all of its own. They've really invested in something that I like to call the anti-Navy, which is the PLA rocket force. So for relatively low cost, they can, they can stockpile missiles that are designed to sink our ships and make it very difficult for us to bring a carrier anywhere close to Taiwan. Okay, so you tell me if this makes sense. I did a show ages and ages and ages ago with Bill Perry, who was then a former Secretary of Defense, and he explained that during the Clinton administration, he, Bill Perry, Secretary of Defense, had decided to send a carrier through the Strait of Taiwan yeah. to show our support for Taiwan. That's item one. Item two, I spoke not long ago to a retired admiral who didn't know I was going to quote him, so I won't name him. And I said, if things get rough with Taiwan, how close are, may our, can our carriers get now that they've built all of these these ship killing yeah. weapons is essentially what they are, isn't it? Yes. And the Admiral said, oh, well, that's very simple. Our aircraft carriers must stay 1,000 miles away from Taiwan. Is it, is, they've pushed us out already. Is that true, not true? Well, I still think we have an opportunity. We have, we have advantages in certain areas, right? So our, our, our largest advantage, I would say, is in the realm of, <laughs> of undersea warfare, our submarines, right? That's the ultimate stand-in force. The Commandant of the Marine Corps has a very innovative vision for the previous Commandant and the current Commandant uh, for another stand-in force, which would be small teams of Marines in the southern Japanese island, part of the first island chain, as well as northern Philippine islands, uh, using autonomous joint-like tactical vehicles and naval strike missiles to be able to sink their ships. So there are things we can do, and perhaps the most important is to arm Taiwan itself so that it becomes a porcupine and thus becomes very hard to conquer territorially. Can I just say one thing about yeah, of course you your can. historical example, right? So we've had three Taiwan Strait crises. You've alluded to one of them. This was the biggest show of force since the end of the Vietnam War. In the previous two- By us. By us, right? Uh, and that's when China was, I mean, this was post uh, Gulf War. China had not yet, uh, they'd started to embark on this military buildup, but nothing like we've seen today. Uh, we were leagues ahead of them in terms of military capability. And even in the 50s, when we had the first two Taiwan Strait crises, what did Eisenhower have to do in order to deter the CCP? He went to Congress to get advanced authorization for the use of military force. Some would say he actually threatened to use nuclear weapons. He put Matador cruise missiles on Taiwan itself. These were dramatic moves, and that's what was necessary. That's the level of presidential intestinal fortitude and display of hard power that was necessary to defuse crisis one, two, and three, it would require just as much, if not more, presidential courage and display of hard power to defuse the fourth Taiwan Strait crisis when it comes. Okay. So another couple of questions. You're in teaching mode, I'm in student mode. <laughs> All right, I think I understand what the Chinese are attempting to do. This first island chain is closest to, the, to China. It includes Japan and Taiwan itself. Second island chain farther, got it. Why do we care about the Pacific anyway? Suppose they do push us back to the second island chain. Who cares who's watching this program in Appleton, Wisconsin? Yeah. What difference does that make? Every well, who said we get to run the Pacific <laughs> when, they, when China is? Why shouldn't they have at least regional hege hegemony? Almost everything in your house, whether you live in Appleton, Green Bay, or God forbid you live in Washington, DC, or even worse, California, um, uh, if it has an on and off switch, it probably has a, a chip that is made in the Indo-Pacific and in Taiwan specifically. So if we abandon our, our, our treaty commitments to countries like Japan and the Philippines uh, and our, the Taiwan Relations Act, whereby we commit to help <coughs> Taiwan defend itself and allow China to take over Taiwan, they will be able to hold the rest of the world economically 
hostage. And that economic coercion that we hate, again, it will multiply by 20-fold. Um, when it comes to our military commitments, it would render our ability to fulfill treaty commitments, the ones I mentioned, almost uh, impossible, right? And that would, we would take a, a massive hit in terms of the credibility of our commitments everywhere else. Put differently, um, Las Vegas rules would not apply. What happens in the first island chain or the second island chain would not stay there. Because ultimately, I do believe that Xi Jinping is not just content to export, or to perfect his model of techno-totalitarian control within China's borders or inside the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, increasingly it appears to me that he's trying to export that model of governance around the world in order to prove that it works better. Can I say one more thing? Of course you may. If, I, you know, I know we've had this bruising debate about the extent of our international commitments, you know, so-called forever wars and things right, like right, that. Right, right, right. To me, there's something fundamentally different, let's say, between a war to democratize a country that has little to no experience with democracy, and you can say that Afghanistan and Iraq, Iraq were part of that and there was mission creep involved. There's something different between that and helping an existing, flourishing democracy Taiwan. that at least according to Taiwan, to some, by some metric is actually freer than our own society, defend itself against a totalitarian government that is trying to extinguish its ability to exist as a democratic Okay, um, very, mo very moving, very moving. Let me tell you about two little countries in hostile neighborhoods. Taiwan is one, Israel's another. Yes. Israel spends 5% of GDP on defense. Taiwan spends, on, uh, Taiwan spends a little under 3%, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Why should we, but, but, by the way, we spend 3.6% of GDP. Why should yeah. we spend more GDP on their defense, so to speak, than they do themselves? How come? Well, it's in our interest for the three reasons I, I laid out before. But I will say this about the Taiwans. By the way, there's this debate among actual like uh, Asia specialists, which I am not one. I just play one on TV about whether to call them the Taiwanese or the Taiwans. That could be the subject of a separate podcast. Taiwanese just sounds easier we'll to do me. An hour on that yeah, later. exactly. Yeah, <clears throat> you will lose all your listenership. Um, uh, they have made significant reforms, increased overall spending, uh, trying to invest in asymmetric weapon systems, and increasing notably the length of conscription and uh, mandatory service so requirements in Taiwan. It. Exactly. They're headed in the right direction, but I think they will go as far as we are willing to lead. And oh, by the way, for years we've been hammering them to invest more in asymmetric defense and things like harpoon missiles as opposed to, you know, uh, fourth or fifth gen fighters that are likely to get blown up on day one of the invasion. Well, if we can't actually provide the asymmetric weapons that they purchase and then get delayed for decades, then I'm not sure how much our criticism has an effect. We have harpoon missiles that aren't going to that were uh, purchased in 2015, approved by Congress, and are still not going to be delivered until 2027, 2029, because our foreign military sales process is totally broken here. So if we fix that, or if we took the harpoons that we're about to spend money demilling and putting into deep storage and gave them to Taiwan, then I think you would see more uh, effort to reform on Taiwan itself. Okay. We, <clears throat> at the end of the Reagan period, the number of battle force ships in the United States Navy was just under 600. Today it's 294. My source on this is you. 294. <laughs> it might be 291 now. Maybe 291? Worse. It's hard to keep track. We do. Since you wrote Somewhere your last piece in the Wall Street Journal? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. It, the, it's, it's shrinking that fast. And the Biden administration, their most recent budget calls for it to shrink even further. Now, there are arguments that each one of these vessels is much more capable than a vessel was 40 years ago. There are arguments about this. But, as you said a moment ago, quantity has a quality all its own. Two years from now, the Chinese are expected to have 400 battle force ships in their Navy. That's item one. Item two, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps. Only your Marines met their recruiting goals last year. Yeah. The other three missed, and the Army missed its recruiting goal for the 10th time in 10 years. We have a superpower projecting its power, doing the things that you, Chinese police in Manhattan, and we have permitted the United States Army to fall 10% below full strength? Yeah. What is going on? You've hit on the two biggest issues facing DOD right now, um, which is uh, shipbuilding and a recruiting crisis. Uh, on the first, um, 
If you look back at the story of the 600 ship Navy, I think you, you guys got to 595. Didn't quite get to 600. I've heard tales about this decade called the 80s. And I, you yeah, have, yes, yeah, yes, yes, uh, yes. But uh, really what, what allowed that effort to be successful against um, extreme bureaucratic resistance, by the way, was uh, Reagan himself prioritizing it, selling it to the American people, and empowering John Lehman as Secretary of the Navy to implement a shipbuilding program that was informed first and foremost by a strategy for projecting sea power. And in this administration and in the Trump administration, we haven't had that, right? We've had a promise to get to a 355 ship Navy, but we've had internal fighting between the services. Uh, we've had, I think, mostly uh, the defense enterprise run by former army officers, a lot of whom I like and respect, but it's fair to say that unless the president himself makes it a priority and forces the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Navy to wake up every single day to push the five-sided building and the shipbuilding industrial base to deliver on time and on budget, it's simply not gonna happen, right? Because the workforce is so uh, advanced that it, you can't just like turn the spigot on and off. And we've had, a, we've had a inconsistent demand signal. We have multiple shipbuilding plans that don't interact with each other. And oh, by the way, Biden's shipbuilding plan, as China builds the largest Navy in the world, as its ships start to get more capable than ours, by the way, it by some measures has the three biggest navies in the world, if you count their Coast Guard and their maritime militia. Our, under the Biden plan, the U.S. Navy is going to bottom out at about 280 ships at 2027. 2027 is the date that Xi Jinping has set for the People's Liberation Army to be ready to take Taiwan. So this is the worst possible time to have your priority force in your priority theater the United States Navy to be at its weakest point. We could be weakest when they're strongest. I will, I will continue with China in a moment, but listen to this. Raphael Cohen, director of strategy and doctrine program at RAND, quote, for years, American defense strategy argued that the United States should have sufficient military capability and capacity to fight and win two simultaneous wars in different theaters. Over the last decade though, as America's military shrank and its adversaries grew increasingly capable, the Pentagon has backed off such aspirations. Mm -hmm. So we have forces that are designed to operate in two theaters at best. Ukraine and the North Atlantic, Taiwan and the Pacific, and now the Middle East and the Med. That makes three. Yeah. How dangerous is this moment? I think we're at uh, our most dangerous moment since I mean, you could go back to, to 1962, uh, you go back to 1950. It's increasingly looking like the interwar period, though, where we sort of fall victim to a variety of utopian delusions, we disarm, we're politically divided, and all of a sudden we stumble into war on someone else's terms. That's what concerns me. Maybe the better case is that it's the late 1970s, and you know we have an economic crisis, we have an energy crisis. You have the greatest uh, nation in the world sleepwalking. Indeed. Uh, we go through the cycle, though, in America, right? By the way, Rafi Cohen is brilliant. I went to grad school with him. It was infuriating to have, he like actually understood things, and I was just like struggling to get by. Um, uh, we, we go through these periods, right? It's why defense spending looks like a sine curve, right? Because we like win a cold or hot war, and then the sentiment in America is to bring the boys home because we are what Colin Dweck has called reluctant crusaders, right? We like to think of ourselves as crusading for a noble global cause, the defender of the free world, but we're reluctant to pay the cost. And ultimately then we have to pay more money, ironically and tragically, when we have to rearm when we find ourselves um, in a kinetic confrontation. So the challenge in the present day, and it really kind of gets in my mind to the paradox of deterrence, is if we want to, if we want to prevent a war with China, if we want to prevent World War III, we have to convince Xi Jinping that we're actually willing to go to war, and we have to put the Pentagon on a war footing to maximize the production of ships and long-range precision fires, which we have yet to do. Okay, so you're in your, one, two, three, two, four, six, you're in your seventh year in the House of Representatives. You've been in this town for seven years, you've been in this institution for seven years. What's your feeling about the temper of Washington and the temper of Congress? Are people now with this attack on Israel, are, is everybody started walking around and say, fellas, maybe we ought to pull ourselves together? Or, or do you still feel, I mean, the Republican majority in the House just took three <laughs> weeks to elect a new speaker. What? It just feels as though you're talking about extremely serious yeah, things yeah. and there's a lack of a connection between what you're talking about and the way this town feels. Yeah. Honestly, there's a lack of connection between what you're talking about and the way the press reports the situation. I know. The, the amount of good military or strategic reporting is very thin in this country, at least at the present. 
Oh, sorry, that, I gave a speech. What I wanted to do is get to a question. Have things changed over your seven years in town? I think there is a growing awareness of the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party in particular, but more generally by what I call sort of the anti-American access, right? A recognition that increasingly this looks like a proper access, a raid against our interest and our allied interest. China is, of course, the dominant partner in this arrangement. Putin is his his junior partner. He is, to quote my good friend Tom Tugendhat, uh, uh, Putin's tethered goat uh, in Europe. Uh, and Iran increasingly looks like a partner in this. I think there's a <clears throat> growing awareness of the threat, but honestly, we have yet to translate that awareness and it's bipartisan into action, into the things that would actually make a difference. And honestly, when it comes to things like um, revitalizing our munitions industrial base and building a ton of missiles that can sink Chinese ships, doing to them what they've done to us, like flipping the script and building our own anti-Navy, that's not a massive investment of money. All you need is certainty over the course of the five-year defense plan. And it's my hypothesis that for the sum of about 10 to $15 billion a year for the next five years, we could massively turbocharge our munitions industrial base and pre-position those weapons in the Indo-Pacific. Because if they're not pre-positioned, and this is a lesson of Ukraine, we're not gonna have the luxury of sort of like surging them forward. Because the very things that make Taiwan hard to conquer, i.e. it's an island, make it very difficult to resupply, unlike Ukraine. So we're struggling. And the Republican Party, admittedly, is divided uh, on national security. That division has always existed, right? It goes back to, um, you know, Taft, Taft versus Eisenhower, Eisenhower right? Um, you know, Eisenhower <laughs> settled the debate for a while, but it reemerges, right? We haven't nominated a, a true isolationist, I think, since Alf Landon in 36. Um, but so we tend, on balance, to be conservative internationalists. But there's a real divide in the Republican Party right now. It's going to take a president, I think, to resolve that divide. Back to matters here at home. You wrote not long ago, and here we are talking about global strategy, and here's what you're writing about. TikTok, I'm quoting you, TikTok, which is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, is close to becoming the dominant media company in the U.S. This is untenable, close quote. TikTok? <laughs> You're taking your time with TikTok? I know. Persuade me that it matters. I'm supposed to, I was like, the, I was the youngest member of Congress, I think, uh, when I got elected. So I'm supposed to be the cool young guy who like, you know, is friendly to social stuff. media, right. but I'm not. I'm like the least cool. I'm the old man yelling, get off my lawn most of the time. Um, TikTok, fundamental problem with TikTok, put aside just the, the, the problem with social media use in general. And I think uh, people like Jonathan Haidt have convincingly demonstrated that it's strongly correlated with rising rates of anxiety, depression, and suicide, and it's having an incredibly negative effect on the next generation. But that's, that's true of all social media apps. The problem with TikTok in particular is that it is owned by a Chinese company called ByteDance. And ByteDance, like all Chinese companies, but particularly their champions, is effectively controlled by the CCP. You've had, you have CCP members embedded in their corporate governance structure. <laughs> You've had ByteDance officials having to apologize for failing to follow uh, appropriate political direction. And so given that TikTok is quickly becoming the go-to news source for the next generation, we have to ask ourselves if it is a wise decision to allow a CCP-controlled company to be the dominant news platform in America. I don't know what the right Cold War analogy would be, but it would be as if at the height of the Cold War, we allowed KGB and Pravda to buy, you know, the New York Times, CBS, ABC. And that probably understates the stupidity of it um, because of how, how insidious uh, tweaking the algorithm could be. It's not an so easy we, to we, solve. So, so I was about to say, yeah. how, how do you ban that without running into problems with the First Amendment? I, I see at least three paths forward, right? I mean, I think there's, you, can, you can address foreign ownership of a company without stepping on right. First Amendment issues, right? So you can either ban it, and I think there's a legal way to ban it. You would, you know, your 14-year-old might be upset with you, but I mean, such is the price of national security. Um, you could force a sale to an American company and done right, all the American investors who own a ton of ByteDance would not necessarily lose money if the Chinese Communist Party were to allow a sale. And as long as that new company had control of the algorithm, that would satisfy my concerns. So there essentially would be a fork in the road between Chinese TikTok, Doyin, which by the way, they, only, they restrict the amount of time their own kids have access to it in China, and the content is restricted to educational content, which proves the point that they understand this is digital fentanyl, because it's highly addicted and ultimately starts in China. Or the third thing, uh, would be just to insist on reciprocity and say, okay, we will consider allowing TikTok to continue to operate in the United States 
if you allow our social media companies to operate in China. Because of course, your average Chinese citizen doesn't have access to Twitter or X, Facebook, uh, YouTube. And what makes it even more absurd is that their officials, their wolf warrior diplomats, their propagandists are all over those same platforms in America, spreading anti-American propaganda and disinformation like the fact that the uh, pandemic came from an American lab and not the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Okay, a moment ago you mentioned American investors in, what is it called? Byte ByteDance. In yeah. ByteDance, which leads me to another of your <clears throat> proposals for dealing with matters here at home. I'm quoting you again. Wall Street is funneling U.S. capital into Chinese companies on at least six different U.S. government blacklists. American capital into Chinese companies that our own government has identified as trouble. Yeah. How, what, what do you want to do? You're taking on Wall Street now? TikTok you can almost see, but now you're going to go charge up, take the SL up to Manhattan and start shouting at those offices? What, what, what? Uh, how do you want to handle this problem? Promise me if I pass away uh, and the explanation is that I fell from a balcony yes, or exactly. that you will not accept the official <laughs> right. uh, explanation. Um, but uh, listen, I, I should be clear. I'm not alleging that any of these asset managers or venture capital funds that are investing in China have done anything illegal. In fact, I think what this illustrates is the problem. They're just looking for the highest returns. Exactly, right? Uh, it's the same reason Dillinger robbed banks, right? Because that's where the money is. Although increasingly it looks like China's a bad investment. We can come back to that. Um, the problem is we have these various lists that you referenced. These lists don't talk to each other, and so it's hard for us to enforce the lists. Um, and I- Is your State Department, who puts this stuff together? There this are list? treasury lists, there are State Department lists. There, incidentally- so there, This is the usual bureaucracy. In 1999, we, we, I wasn't in Congress at the time, but uh, we passed a law saying the executive branch had to come up with a, a list of communist Chinese military companies. They ignored the requirement, and then it wasn't until Schumer, Cotton, uh, myself and a, a Democrat in the House sent a letter to the previous administration that they actually published a list 20 years too late. So there's confusion about the list. And I think people are now starting to understand that we are in some meaningful sense funding our own destruction, right? We're, we're American dollars, including retirement dollars from American military service members are going to Chinese military companies that are building things designed to kill Americans in a future conflict. This situation is totally absurd. Or technology companies that are being used to facilitate a genocide of Uyghur Muslims in, in Xinjiang. So again, it's not an easy problem to solve because we're trying to unwind over 20 years of just relentless integration of China into the global economy. And I'm not saying, and I'm, I'm fine with a sector specific approach that isn't a complete cutoff, but at least when it comes to Chinese military companies and technology companies, we need to cut off the flow of U.S. capital so we don't allow them to, we don't help them achieve their goals, which involve the destruction of American global leadership. Um, Ukraine. There are fights about Ukraine, fights about what we should be doing in Ukraine. Uh, we've, our involvement has escalated. That seems to be the way the Biden administration wants to do it. First, we will send them, then we won't send them this. Now we're up to uh, tanks, Abrams tanks, and now he's talking about cluster bombs. So it's just been creeping up, creeping up. We have this strange feature that on the ground, we were all told there was going to be a Ukrainian summer offensive. It got essentially nowhere. Yeah. All right. And you have foreign policy analysts, such as Elbridge Colby, arguing that this is a terrible sink of American resources yeah. and of limited American mind share. In this town, people who should be concerned with China are instead concerned with Ukraine. And we are now, as I understand it, this is the amount that's attributable to Ukraine, we are now $19 billion behind in delivering to Taiwan yeah. weapons and equipment that they have already paid for. The other argument is, we let Ukraine go, and Xi Jinping says, oh, that's how you stand up for the little guys. Yeah. So do you subscribe to the argument that the defense of Taiwan runs through Ukraine? I do. Uh, I, again, first let me say, um, well, I guess let me try and unpack that a little bit. Sure. I'm not unbiased when it comes to Bridge Colby because I, I consider him a, a friend, and I, I think his book, uh, Strategy of Denial, is one of the best books written uh, in recent years. And though we disagree about this issue, 
He's right that China remains our foremost national security threat and that we have to prioritize the Indo-Pacific theater and we have to find a way to deal with all these crises. More to the point, he wrote a, an article in Time recently that I actually thought was a, a thoughtful attempt to strike a middle ground between these two positions. So sometimes I think he's unfairly characterized as never Ukraine, Taiwan only, which is actually not uh, his, his position. Um, if you accept the fact that the most important thing we can do to help Taiwan is to turn it into a porcupine and increase our hard power in the Indo-Pacific, I still do think that the outcome of the war in Ukraine has an effect on deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. Or certainly Xi Jinping is at a minimum paying attention to whether or not we allow Vladimir Putin to succeed in Ukraine. And as I alluded to before, I think that Russia and China have been waging a cold war against us for quite some time. And we are just now waking up to that fact. And if you disagree with all of that, if you talk to any of our closest allies in the Indo-Pacific or partners like Taiwan, they certainly believe that the outcome in Ukraine matters for peace they do. and stability in the Indo-Pacific. The Japanese believe that. Uh, it put, put, uh, yeah, the Japanese is a perfect example. Japan is, is embarking on like a historic defense buildup right now, not just because of the threat from China, but what they're seeing in terms of Ukraine. I think we don't have the luxury of making this an either or choice. I actually think this represents an opportunity to fix some of the problems we talked about before. The fragility of our munitions industrial base. If we were to make a generational investment in things that are relevant for both Ukraine and Taiwan, we wouldn't have to make this agonizing decision of, okay, we only have one harpoon. Does it go to Taiwan or Ukraine? I'm simplifying for dramatic effect. Congressman, I'll tell you a much cheaper, much quicker solution to the whole problem. <laughs> it's the CHIPS Act. For $50 billion, we subsidize Intel and maybe two or three others to start producing all those super sophisticated chips right here in this country. And Vivek Ramaswamy, when asked, I say Vivek Ramaswamy as though he's an oracle, but he's certainly compelling to a lot of particularly young Republicans, or young kids. Vivek Ramaswamy, when I don't have the quotation here, but he would only commit to the defense of Taiwan for five years because it, that's about how long it'll take for us to build facilities, to build these super sophisticated chips. And once we do that, yeah. then we don't need Taiwan. Now he didn't put it quite that way, but he would only commit to defending Taiwan for five years. So as long as Congressman Mike Gallagher says, listen folks, we really need to decouple our economy, yeah. at least in large measure, at least from the Chinese military, the, well, actually, Joe Biden is a step ahead of you. He's spent $50 billion to build our own super sophisticated chip industry. Yeah. And Congressman Gallagher responds how? Uh, well, first, I should note, I've told Vivek that I disagree with this position because, one, it reduces our interest in Taiwan to just the fact that Taiwan is a, a, a chip uh, superpower, which, of course, we have broader interest in Taiwan. And two, you're basically saying to Xi, on a date certain, just be patient for five years, and then you can take Taiwan. And they would still have the ability to hold the rest of the world economic hostage, even if we meaningfully sort of weaned ourselves off our dependency on Taiwan for chip production, which gets to the flaws, I think, in the chip sack. $52 billion is a lot of money, um, but it's a drop in the bucket in terms of what TSMC spends. Um, TSMC is the, uh, the semiconductor company in Taiwan. In Taiwan, yes. Um, there are a lot of restrictions that the Biden administration has placed on uh, receiving a CHIPS Act grant, which I think are going to increase the price and negate our ability to have a chip fab renaissance here domestically. So to put a finer point on it, if we had an extra $50 billion, we should have spent it on a CHIPS Act, not a CHIPS Act, in order to actually build a Navy that can deter a PLA invasion of Taiwan in the first place, thus rendering the possibility of them disrupting the chip global supply chain uh, moot in the first place. And that would have been a wiser investment so of I, our resources. Let's, let's take it. You actually know this stuff. Well, you know that, know. Or, or, you, or you persuade me that you know it, which is <laughs> just as good for my purposes. I right have now. good friends that are actual, like, smart China people, and I just, okay. like, constantly am pestering them. But for what ideas. are the numbers? To build the defense that we need, <sighs> what are the numbers? What, the, the, yeah. the current federal budget is up to $1.7 trillion. Is that the number? Yes, yeah, Something right. like that? Yeah. So what do we need? What, yeah. what do you need? If, you, if I could give you an extra $100 billion a year yes, and let you spend it the way you want to spend it for the next decade? That's a great question. Could you do everything you wanted to do? Yes. What's the number? Because it's not that expensive in, by the absurd terms of the size of the federal budget. 
it's as if for a great nation, it's not that expensive to build the military we need. Isn't that right? Or I've, I've am made, I dreaming? I've made the claim that uh, for 10 to $15 billion, and, and, and smart folks and I, like Mark Montgomery, have made this claim too. You could, you could fix the long-range precision fire munitions industrial base issue, which is sort of your most bang for your buck. The Navy would require more money over time. But more than anything else, the Navy or the companies that build ships for the Navy just need a consistent demand signal. That is, we're going to get to X ships. You know, in my home state in Ficantaria, you're going to be producing two frigates a year. We'll have a second yard with that gets us to four frigates a year. We're going to get to 2.5 Virginia class subs every year. Like you can map out the plan, have that certainty, and make that generational investment in American shipbuilding. And then you can start to get creative with things. In fact, the, the reason we've struggled, honestly, with the defense budget right now is because the Defense Department reflects the, broad, the challenge we have in the rest of society, which is that what's crowding out money for hard power is money for entitlements. It's, it's retirements Let me quote you, and personnel costs. You're really good on This is a good quotation. The military crisis is a microcosm of the broader societal crisis. We're increasingly becoming a healthcare and retirement organization that happens to have guns. I said that? Right, explain that, explain that. <laughs> well, somebody on your staff, maybe. Yeah, no, so I write my own stuff. Of course you do. Come on. Uh, so explain that, explain yeah. that. Uh, so I used to have the numbers uh, at hand, but um, uh, if, you, if you compare, if you, um, if you compare, uh, there's a recent book that came out by Arnold Panaro, uh, The Ever-Shrinking Fighting Force, uh, which is great on, on the subject. If you basically compare in inflation-adjusted terms Reagan's defense buildup, right? The heady days of the 600-ship Navy, for which yeah. I give you all the credit. Thank you very 595 much. 595 or whatever. Close, around close, um, enough, close enough. To the Obama military cut, right? The days of sequester, defense sequester, and things like that. We were still spending uh, more money uh, on during the Obama cut than we were in the Reagan years. There, but that money was going to personnel costs, right? It's health care. It's retirement costs. Your average cost of everything has gone up, right? So th if you don't fix that fundamental issue, it's gonna be increasingly hard to spend a defense dollar wisely. Uh, defense dollars are increasingly not spent on procuring actual weapons. They're going to fixed costs largely for personnel that's crowding out all our other investments. There's some other areas where I think you could be pretty aggressive in terms of reform, right? Um, the tooth to tail ratio, which is like the level roughly, the amount of sort of bureaucrats we have in the Pentagon versus people that are actually at the tip of the spear has grown worse. The acquisition workforce is about 175,000 people strong. That's almost the size of the United States Marine Corps. The largest military service branch is not the Army, it's DOD civilians at over 800,000 people. That ratio has gotten work. And good luck trying to fire these people. You'll get sued. It's almost impossible for even the Secretary of Defense to fire people. So that's a harder thing to fix. Oh, and the Pentagon owns one of the largest property books uh, in the world. For the life of me, I don't understand why we can't uh, force the United States Navy to sell all the golf courses and hotels that it owns and oh, recycle those now, assets now, now, those and let's words. plow that money, which may only be like $2 billion, but $2 billion can buy you a lot of missiles and uh, maybe uh, add, add destroyer and have uh, two frigates. Okay, so one other question, although this is just occurring to me, so the, I'm forming it as, a, as, a, as I speak. Uh, which means this will be a very sloppy question. It seems to me, I live in Silicon Valley. You're quite right to make fun of California because of the people who run the place. And you the cleaned it up in, the, in, in preparation for she's San Francisco visit. got cleaned up because a big, big time communist was coming. Not for the people who live there. But here's what California does have. Really smart kids. Yeah. The tech industry. And the tech industry is in interesting regards, becoming a defense tech yeah. industry. So Palantir, Anderil, Epirus, uh, the, uh, there's a new company called Mach, M-A-C-H. On and on and on it goes. It, it, does it make sense, shrink the Pentagon, just have those acquisition, 175,000 acquisition officers Spend money on these really yeah. bright kids. We can, the, the, excuse me, I'll back it up. Here's the way it seems to me. And you will know more. This is one place where you actually will know more than I do. China's bigger than we are. It'll always be bigger. Mm -hmm. China's almost as rich as we are, taken as a whole. Their economy is, depending on how you measure it, some people think it has actually become yeah. bigger than ours. Power parity. Because it's a totalitarian state, it'll always be able to outspend us on defense if it wants to. 
our only sustainable advantage over a country much bigger and as rich is our ability to innovate. Yeah. And so just somehow it seems to me as though some big part of the solution to this problem lies in that five-sided building yeah. figuring out how to tap into the talent that's bursting out everywhere in the country, not just in California. Is that, am I saying something sensible? I don't yes. know how you translate it into policy No, I, I, I agree with what I think is the premise of your question. I have two unoriginal solutions for it. Um, one is ultimately... For an immodest guy, you're terribly modest. Yeah. Uh, what's, there was a great Churchill describing Clement Attlee uh, as a modest man with and, plenty and of, with to reasons. be modest about Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, which is, as opposed to sort of doling out what's called uh, CIBRs grants, Small Business Innovation Research Grants, these are s relatively small bets on these innovative companies that don't ultimately allow them to become programs of record and then transition into becoming the next generation of new defense prime companies. The Pentagon ne needs to make a smaller number of bigger bets on promising companies, which leads to the second thing, and I think where Congress needs to come in. We need to allow the Pentagon to fail. Right? We need to allow the Pentagon to make original mistakes. And this gets to a cultural problem that's harder to solve in the acquisition workforce. If you're like a GS-15 or a lieutenant colonel or colonel working in the acquisition world, like you don't get promoted by taking risk on an innovative company. You get promoted on making sure you just like reinforce <laughs> the status quo. So some way where we can encourage the Pentagon using the authorities we've already given them to make those bigger bets and be okay if some of those bets don't work out, to me is the path forward. I would zoom out and say something at a sort of national level that we need to do. And this will get me in trouble, I think. Um, one of our advantages has to be the way in which we attract talent, not only in the defense uh, industrial base, but like globally, talent to the United States. To me, the obvious path forward, uh, and this would be a massive win vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis China, would be to, okay, fix the unmitigated disaster that is the southern border, but then modernize our immigration system so we make it easier for people that have critical skill sets in critical technology to come here. Maybe I'll put this in like a more cartoonish terms. In my uni like alternative universe that will never exist, the next Republican president would like appoint a uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, who's hardcore on the southern border, appoint Jocko Willink, former Navy SEAL, and say, you have 100 days to get 100% operational control of the southern border. Come back with your shield or on it, Jocko. Uh, but the deputy is going to be a guy from your world in Silicon Valley, like Paul Graham. And Paul Graham's mission is going to be to go all around the world on a recruiting mission. And if you are particularly in an allied country like Australia, the United Kingdom, or a critical <laughs> partner country like India, and you have a skill set we need to modernize our military, but also just to revitalize our innovative and uh, scientific establishment. Like we, we want you here, and we're going to have appropriate controls and vetting. But it ha that has to be a. But you know where a lot of those people are going to be? They're going to be in China. Well, again, you can insist on basic reciprocity, right? Uh, okay. So if we're only five thousand of our students are allowed to study in China, then at a minimum, that that should be the cap for Chinese students here. The problem we have with Chinese students here is that the connections between you know, civilian researcher with benign intent, PLA-affiliated researcher, member of the United Front Work Department, is incredibly opaque. We had a ban on PLA-affiliated researchers in the Trump administration. It's hard for these universities to, um, uh, we can't ask them to be the FBI. The FBI has limited resources to do this. So we have to do a balance of appropriate vetting if we're gonna allow Chinese students here because we've just seen uh, rampant theft of our intellectual property, particularly dual-use technology. Thank you very much. You've just solved uh, the global strategic problem, the military problem, and now immigration. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about you. You're 39. You and your wife have two little girls. You have given your 30s to politics. You're going to keep with it? What do you want your 40s to look like? <laughs> I think my wife wants my 40s to look like me back home in Wisconsin. Uh, I should say that this was not part of like a conscious design. To the extent I was shaping my career prior to this, I wanted to be like a, a national security professional or have a private sector career that would then allow me to do stints of service in the national security world, you know, if there was an opportunity to Could work. Can I make an obvious point? Minute. Yeah. Forgive me because it's a very crude point. Yeah. Princeton, Georgetown, Marine Corps, 
why aren't you working up at Goldman Sachs? You could be making real money, Mike. I know, it never occurred to me in my 20s that that was a, a thing that one should do, and all my friends did it. Uh, but so, so, so explain that, <laughs> Princeton to the Marine Corps. What was the thought process there? Uh, a few things. One, I had um, started studying the Middle East and Arabic as an undergraduate, and I really fell in love with the language and the region. And the more I went down that sort of intellectual rabbit hole, I started to think, okay, how could I apply these skills? What does one do having learned Arabic? And the military, I don't come from a military family, but the military stood out as a way to scratch that intellectual itch while also serving my country, while also, quite frankly, um, challenging myself to see if I had what it took. I had, I had always sort of taken on academic challenges. Um, I wasn't the greatest athlete in the world growing up, but I wanted something that would combine the academic challenge with the physical challenge with the leadership challenge, right? And the Marine Corps seemed like the hardest crucible I could throw myself into. And, and it was, did, did it give you what you wanted? Absolutely. It was, besides marrying my wife, the best decision I've ever made uh, in my life and uh, was phenomenal. And honestly, on the private sector side, I think it opened up opportunities I couldn't have conceived of. You mentioned the, the fact that I wasted uh, my GI Bill in order to get these useless uh, graduate degrees. Um, but that would not have been possible were it not for my service and the GI Bill. And that's a, I mean, that was a huge opportunity. Um, so, okay, I kind of, so you're a young guy. You've already established yourself as one of the bright lights here, or the former speaker <laughs> wouldn't have given you this committee to chair. So that's a big deal by the standards of the House of Representatives. Wait, that, that's the key phrase, the standards of the House of Representatives. Uh, well, I'm being graded on a curve. So, so, <laughs> so, so how do you think about the next decade? I would like to do, I, I, I've never thought of Congress as a career, right? I'm a, I'm a proponent of, of term limits. I don't conceive of myself of staying in politics for uh, another decade. I, I would ultimately like to have that balance between a private sector career and stints of service. I mean, my passion is national security. That's always going to be the case. I suspect if I'm able to live, you know, until I'm 80, I'm still going to be tinkering on, you know, uh, foreign policy op-eds for the Wall Street Journal that nobody besides you will read. Um, so that's always going to be a big foundation of my life. I will say now being married and having kids, uh, being away from my family is very difficult. Uh, and this is a very difficult life. Uh, and so people, I know it's easy to criticize members you, of Congress, the, but... The, your wife and the girls are back in Wisconsin? Back in Wisconsin. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's rough. That's yeah. rough. Three and one, you don't want to miss much of that. Yes. When the girls are that little. Indeed. Heroes. John Paul II, I think, is one of your heroes. Yes. Pope John Paul II. Yes. Explain that. And you taped a video, sitting member of the United States Congress representing Green Bay and Appleton, tapes the video and puts it up on YouTube with a few words of advice to the current pontiff. Francis may fear that he lacks the power to confront the tyrants in Beijing, but John Paul II knew better. He saved Jewish people from Nazis, ministered to the assassin who shot him, and stood up to godless communist tyranny. He repeated those three earth-shaking words throughout his homilies, be not afraid. As a Catholic, I pray that Pope Francis may heed John Paul II's advice in dealing with the Chinese Communist Party. Holy Father, I implore you, be not afraid. Mass has been awkward since I published that output and did did that video. I don't know what now I'm afraid. I, I don't know what that does for your time in purgatory, Congressman. But so <sighs> where what, what, how does it come into your head to, well, been, to tape a message to the Pope? I've been troubled by uh, the Catholic Church's approach to China and Pope Francis in particular. And of course, uh, John Paul II's message in Poland was was be not afraid. Um, and I think he did play a role as, as Peggy Noonan's uh, book on John Paul II, as the, the more lengthy biography of John Paul II teases out in the fall of the Soviet Union. Because um, ultimately, if you look at sort of the contest between communism and the free world, it, it is in some ways a spiritual contest. Communism, uh, to kind of paraphrase uh, Whitaker Chambers' book Witness, is really a vision of a world without God, right? It is, it is the idea articulated by the serpent in the Garden of Eden that ye shall be as gods, and it's why Xi Jinping can't tolerate the existence of religion unless it's heavily sinicized uh, in China. Pope Francis has accepted this deal whereby the Chinese Communist Party gets to nominate, but effectively appoint Catholic bishops in China, which is not only a problem for the Catholic Church, but it's then allowed Xi Jinping to apply pressure to other faiths uh, in China. Of course, famously, uh, the CCP wants to appoint the successor to the Dalai Lama. Uh, and there's a cultural genocide uh, underway in Tibet as there's an actual genocide in Xinjiang. And I think, oh, also interestingly enough, uh, the CCP is rewriting the Bible. 
The famous story in the Gospel of John when uh, Jesus defends the adulterous woman when the Pharisees are trying to trap him and he has the greatest comeback line of all time, which is, he is without sin, can cast the first stone, and everybody <laughs> runs away. In the Chinese, approved, the CCP-approved translation of that story, when it comes time for Jesus to pick up the stone, he says uh, to the woman, I too am a sinner, uh, but if the men... Uh, we're only executed by those without, if, if the law were only executed by men without blemish, the law would be dead. And then he stones the woman. So for a Christian, this is obviously that's heretical. A, that's on, just at least, a, not yes, a nuance. That's a total. A, a story of grace and forgiveness becomes a story about a dissident challenging the power of the state, which is obviously unacceptable for Xi Jinping. And I think Pope Francis has a massive opportunity to help us with this spiritual battle. And I can't help but think the church would flourish if he bravely stood against the Chinese Communist Party. But instead, he's instructed Catholics in China to, to be good citizens, which I read as a, as a you know, don't rock the boat, um, don't challenge uh, uh, the, the party. And we have a Catholic bishop who's still in prison. We have a, a practicing Catholic, Jimmy Lai, in Hong Kong, who's in prison. And I, as far as I can tell, the Pope has been entirely silent on those cases, which I think is a missed opportunity. Um, there's one question here that I hope you're really prepared for, Mike. Uh oh This has been very hard. Three and six. Does that sound like much of a season record to you? Can Jordan Love oh, fix that, or do, you, do, or do, the, do the Packers need to go recruit a new QB? A first down and trip. Okay, I think this is actually like a very Catholic response to your question. I've consoled myself with the following analysis. I grew up in the, I mean, I, like my formative years, Favre was our quarterback. I got to meet Brett Favre in the locker room because my family had a pizza restaurant and we delivered to the Packer locker room and I got Brett Favre food. It's cool. It was like the, it was like as if this is, now I'm challenging the church. It was as if God himself had come down and asked me to get him pizza. Um, and then we had Rodgers, which is like two first ballot Hall of Famers. We won the Super Bowl with both. My view is that you're not allowed to complain if you've had two first ballot Hall of Famers and a Super Bowl in your lifetime for at least 15 years after the Super Bowl. So I have a few more years where I'm not allowed to complain. And more to the point, I've convinced myself that my daughters, it's healthy for them to grow up in an era when the Packers are terrible because it will build character. And if they can demonstrate that they stick with the team, even when they have bad records, then they will be true Packers fans. And, and they're both stuff. Packer owners, so they have a vested interest oh, you have in shares? the team. We do, yes. Oh, wow, no, okay. Last question. Diplomat George Kennan at the beginning of the Cold War. Milwaukee native. Milwaukee native. Spent many years at Princeton. Two connections. Quote, the decision, the decision between the United States and the Soviet Union, the decision will really fall in large measure in this country itself. The issue of Soviet-American relations is in essence an overall, a test of the overall worth of the United States. To avoid destruction, the United States need only measure up to its own best traditions and prove itself worthy of preservation as a great nation." Close quote. We did. We won that Cold War. Does this country possess the moral resources to win this new one? Yes. I mean, I'm still long America. Um, and I, there's no question, if you were just betting right now, you'd still bet on the United States. I mean, we just our, our system of self-government is, is superior to a totalitarian regime where a group of nine people and increasingly one person control everything. Uh, we are far more innovative than the Chinese. We have major problems we need to fix, but we have demonstrated a remarkable capacity for self-renewal. Uh, and to, to sort of paraphrase Kennan, the important thing is as we compete to ensure that we don't become like the state we are competing with, to try and out China, China in an effort to beat China. Um, I would also just point to, even on our worst day, even on uh, when it is most dysfunctional here in Congress, when we're deposing speakers of the House or we have riots here in the Capitol, people are still looking to the United States of America for leadership. When protests, thousands if not millions of people in the streets of Hong Kong protesting the CCP's absorption of Hong Kong uh, emerged, a lot of those people were holding American flags in their hand because they're looking to us 
for leadership. Put differently, we are the good guys. We're the good guys. And part of our problem is we no longer believe that. So with the right leadership, with the spirit of service, where politicians in particular are willing to put the interests of the country ahead of their narrow parochial political careers, I think our best days are still ahead of us. Congressman Michael Gallagher, the man from Green Bay, thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution, and Fox Nation. Thank you.